Hi, everybody. Uh, I want to thank Metcalf. Um, Karen Sunshine and Catherine are amazing. They're really great at their jobs, and, and this is great what they do. I want to thank the other researchers and journalists. The thing that unites us is our uh, innate curiosity about the world, and so I think this is such a great opportunity for us to think about how to communicate that together. Um, as Sunshine mentioned, this is work that I did while I was at Purdue University. Uh, no one ever does research alone. If they pretend they do, they lie. Uh, so this is the result of really a lot of people. And I think about, um, I'm a social scientist. Uh, I have a marine science, more ecological uh, background. But I think about what are some of the management implications? What can we do about some of these ecological impacts uh, trying to move forward? Today I'll go through a background on Great Lakes fisheries. I suspect some of you know about Great Lakes fisheries and some of you have never spent any time thinking about them, but today you will. Uh, and then I'll go into some of the science review of climate change, of some of the anticipated climate change impacts on Great Lakes fisheries, and then um, go into the management needs. Uh, if those impacts, um, what, do, what do we do about them? And then wrap up at the end. When I'm talking about Great Lakes fisheries, I'm talking about fisheries that have existed since human settlement. Uh, since Native American and First Nation tribes um, came to this region, we, we've been depending on fisheries. Um, they provided an important food source for sustenance for a very long time. Uh, when we're talking about commercial fishing in the Great Lakes, we've had commercial fishing at least since European settlement in the late 1600s. Um, and when we're talking about commercial fishing, I mean boats that go out and catch fish on purpose so they can make money from that. Um, all five Great Lakes have active commercial fishing. Lake Ontario has a very small uh, commercial fishing operation. Lake Michigan here is the largest. Uh, in terms of value, economic value, uh, in 2013 they, a study was completed and they did a five-year average uh, of the value of commercial fishing. It's about $20 million for the Great Lakes. And so that's a pretty big number. Um, it, it means that, that commercial fishing plays a role in our Great Lakes economy. $20 million is a lot of money, but that number is dwarfed when we're thinking about the value of recreational fisheries to the Great Lakes. Uh, the American Sport Fishing Association estimates uh, the value of recreational fishing, catching fish for fun, at about $7 billion with a B. So quite a bit of money. Uh, a lot. What I, as a social scientist, like about the seven billion dollars is that even though fishing equipment is expensive, charter boats are expensive, to get to seven billion dollars, that's a lot of people. It means we have a lot of people going out on the water. We have a lot of families. There's a, a large social attachment. People vacation to go fishing in a particular location. They spend money while they're there. Uh, it's multi-generational. And so there's really a large um, social and economic value uh, when we're thinking about recreational fishing in the Great Lakes. So the recreational commercial fisheries, there's a, a lot of value um, to those resources, and so we need to manage them. Uh, fish are not unlimited, and so we need to be making decisions about them. Uh, they talk, Gaydon, uh, Mark Gaydon at the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, is, is uh, this is his dissertation um, research. The, they talk about it kind of in a three-pillar system, and the first pillar being uh, federal mandates from both the United States and Canadian sides. They, those mandates say, Great Lakes are really important, uh, the fish in those lakes are really important, and we should manage them. They mostly devolve the power uh, to the states, the province of Ontario, and, and some of the um, tribal agencies. But they say, if you don't do a good enough job, we'll take that power back. So that's what the, kind of the, the foundation behind that management is. So most of the weight of decision making falls um, to states, provinces, and the tribes, um, the agencies involved. They're natural resources, you know, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources or Ohio Department of Natural Resources, um, those kind of equivalent agencies. Um, that when we talk about managing fisheries, we mean who can fish, who's allowed to fish in our water, um, what gears are they allowed to use, what time of year, um, what's the season for catching fish, and uh, what um, who, what, what, yeah, and where, <laughs> um, what specific locations are they allowed to do so. And so those decisions um, fall heavily upon uh, the state's province and then um, some of the localized tribal agencies. The problem with that is that uh, no fish, no matter how smart it is, knows when it swims from Indiana to Illinois. It has no sense. They can't even tell when they swim from the United States to Canada. Fish are not highly evolved to that extent. 
And so what we needed um, was an umbrella organization that takes a look at the ecosystem. So the Great Lakes Fishery Commission is a binational organization that coordinates all of those different agencies. So they bring together federal, state, provincial, tribal agencies to take a look at managing the Great Lakes ecosystem as a whole. And they also break into individual lake committees. So there's a Lake Michigan committee, a Lake Ontario committee, tasked with thinking about that specific lake and the fisheries for that lake. So I just wanted to give a little bit of background on who manages and how they manage. Um, as we think about what um, some of the projected impacts of fisheries are, um, or of climate change are on, on Great Lakes fisheries, just to think about the complexity of how many people are making those decisions. I'm a social scientist, and um, one of the, res the research that we did, we asked a lot of people involved in fisheries management what types of impacts and threats there are to Great Lakes fisheries. And the first and the second greatest threats were no surprise. Invasive species were first. And that <coughs> is like, undoubtedly what everyone would say. Um, and second is habitat loss. Um, losing habitats means a loss of fisheries. That if fish don't have anywhere to live and breed, there's not going to be more fish. But when it comes to the third greatest threat and kind of a general discussion, in the short term it was non-point source nutrients, which is particularly salient um, in, over this summer. Um, but climate change came out, especially when we were talking about the long term. And so we're, we're really still thinking of climate change as this long term threat, but it is on the radar of people who are starting to make management decisions. The concerns are for a number of different reasons. So changes in water levels, whether they're increases or decreases, can have effects on fisheries. Um, as, as Sunshine mentioned, fisheries are one component of the ecosystem, but if you change any of the other components, um, you will affect fisheries. And so changes in water level, one of the big concerns are, are changes to physical habitat. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, one, of the, one of the really valuable habitats when you're talking about fisheries are marshes. Um, so the, the marshes around the Great Lakes, they're an important nursery and breeding grounds for fish. Um, marshes need water, but they can't have too much water and they can't have too little water. And so at those fluctuations in lake levels that um, we discussed this morning, this can have real impact on some of the, the marshes, which are an important habitat for fish. The next term I'm gonna give you, I promise is the only technical term I will give you all day. Uh, thermal habitat is the idea that fish have to live within a certain temperature range. If it gets too hot, life is terrible. If it gets too cold, life is terrible. Um, it, it mostly means that they can't, um, they can't grow efficiently, they can't reproduce um, as efficiently. And so they like to live, um, they optimally will live in a certain pocket of temperature. And when we think about changes in air temperature, it means that there's likely to be changes in water temperature. And what that will mean for, for thermal habitat, places they can live. The early research is telling us that fish are more likely to move farther north, so temperatures will be uh, will remain cooler the farther north they go, that'll be similar temperatures to what they have in the south now, or they'll go deeper, because um, cold water sinks. So they're more likely to be farther north or deeper. Uh, relating back to that impact, that greatest impact that um, was discussed earlier um, to Great Lakes fisheries, invasive species are a huge part of consideration and management. Um, the charismatic animal on the top right is the sea lamprey, and that um, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission was actually founded um, to deal with sea lamprey. And so it's just one part of their overall portfolio now, but it remains a concern to this day. Um, on the bottom are quagga and zebra mussels, which many of you have heard all about as well. And so invasive species are already a very pressing issue. The concern with climate change is that the Great Lakes have traditionally been kind of hostile. All of you were here last winter. It was cold. It was kind of a terrible place to live. And a lot of animals that are introduced from other places felt it was terrible as well. But as it gets nicer, more, uh, the concern is that more um, species that don't belong here will be able to survive, um, that, we, that we will be making it less hostile for these invasive species. And that's part of a lot of research that's ongoing right now. This is really kind of in the early stages. Uh, the final component that I'll talk to you about is a. Uh, um, when we're, when we're thinking about fisheries, uh, we're not necessarily talking about uh, a loss of fish. That there won't be any fish left in the Great Lakes for us to go catch, either commercially or recreationally. What we're talking about possibly as a change in species composition. When we think about fish, we think about them in terms of cold water, cool water, and warm water. Uh, cold water means that they like to live in cold water. 
Um, and so as the temperatures increase, um, those populations might not survive as well, but it's possible that other species will be able to flourish more. It was discussed earlier, there's going to be winners and losers. There will be winners and losers in terms of humans, there'll be winners and losers in terms of species. Some species will do better, um, but it's identifying and knowing that for management ahead of time. So what can we do about thinking about incorporating some of these concerns into management? It's a million dollar question and we're just starting to ask ourselves that answer. <coughs> We wanted to find out if it's being incorporated, and so we asked if it's being incorporated into their agencies now. Remember, there's a lot of federal, state, provincial agencies involved, um, and about 60% said it's not being integrated, and then another 33% said it was integrated somewhat. And so climate change is really just kind of at the cusp of, of being considered like widespread across agencies in, in terms of thinking about fisheries. Um, our next step was to try to ask how could it be incorporated? Uh, Dealing with climate change um, can be very depressing, and so what you want to think about are, are possibilities for the future. What are mechanisms to start dealing with this? And so um, in terms of um, kind of the people at the policy level, they talked about identifying priority species. Um, some fish are much more important for recreational fishing than others. There's a lot, there's a, a bigger catch. Um, more people go fishing uh, for lake trout than they, you know, they do for a lot of other species. And so thinking about um, those priority species and what, what will be the impacts upon those specific species. Another concern that the policy decision maker said, which also lined up with our kind of research wonks, um, is that they need data. And this is true across uh, climate change science, is that without an established monitoring routine, we won't be able to identify changes. And so if we don't know what the baseline is, then it will be very difficult for us to identify any changes in the future and to mitigate or adapt to those changes. And, and a lot of that is true just in terms of monitoring. Um, Andrew talked about earlier the lack of, of buoys in the middle. Um, we just don't have a, a lot of long-term data sets that, that allow us to, to really know and be able to identify um, impacts from climate change. Um, and those, those numbers are also important for modeling. Climate change, uh, we, you know, we produce thousands of models constantly. The models get better with the more data that we have. And so even though scientists are always calling for more data, it's at kind of the root of our soul that we want as much data and information as possible. When we're talking about climate change, it is a very real limitation and very real concern. Uh, the results of the models and the results of the monitoring are what would allow us to feed back into management. We could take a look at the information that's provided and what we find out, and then we could, we could change decisions. We could make, you know, as we're projecting forward, we would be able to make better decisions. So it's great. There's some uh, mechanisms for thinking about adapting to climate change and some, you know, considerations, but there's also a number of barriers. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier. There's a lot of social political resistance, um, but it's partially because it's such a complex system. We're talking about eight states, two, uh, one province, two federal governments, a number of, of tribes and First Nations, all coming together to make a decision. You know, as, as a human race, we don't come together and make decisions that well. And so projecting out for a long-term decision is, is extremely difficult. Additionally, spatially, something that uh, may be true for Southern Lake Erie may not uh, hold true for Northern Lake Ontario or Lake Superior, right? So if you're just talking about a, a, such a broad geographical scope, um, that figuring out the, the nuances and, and the specifics for, for regional context um, and specific lake context is very difficult. The other limitation is that we think of climate change as a long-term um, concern, but we make decisions on the short term. And so as we make decisions on a yearly basis, if we're really lucky on a five-year basis, then it's very difficult to think about the long term because we're continually making um, short-term decisions. And so figuring out at what point um, we start to make incremental short-term decisions um, for a long-term impact is really a, a big barrier to climate change integration. Just to wrap up, Great Lakes fisheries um, are really important to the region. If you haven't thought about them before, um, they're worth a lot to us socially, ecologically, economically. Uh, climate change is predicted. Um, there's a number of different possible impacts. And again, related to the ecosystem. When we're, um, anything that anyone else talks about related to the ecosystem, 
The fish can't escape the water. They have to live there. And so whatever happens to the water is likely to have impacts on the fish populations. And then finally, there are possibilities for thinking about managing for climate change, um, but there's a number of barriers to overcome as well. And here's a picture of my dad uh, fishing for a cold water species on Lake Ontario. <laughs> That's it. Thank you.